All right. It's hard to imagine an entire city mobilized in that way, uh, but that's really what was happening. And now, uh, retired Court of Appeals Judge Ben Cantrell, a regular in our program since we began five years ago, will come up and give you a play-by-play uh, -play description of the investigation of 1975 and also explore some ethical issues that may have uh, affected both the, the investigation itself and also the representation of one of the suspects. On Easter Sunday, 1975, the police did know that their investigation had entered into a new dimension. Now, they knew they had to find a killer, somebody who had kidnapped a nine-year-old child, strangled her and disposed of her body in a dilapidated garage only 200 yards from her home. It's not clear when they also knew that she had been raped, uh, but her parents didn't learn that until they attended a hearing in juvenile court involving a su suspect who had been arrested and charged with Marsha's murder. The bizarre facts of that charge will be related to you shortly. The intense and massive investigation that began with Marsha Tremble's disappearance had to shift into another gear. Before the body was found, the police had to deal with all the strange anonymous tips about her whereabouts. I was a trial judge in David, Davidson County Chancery Court at that time, and the courthouse came alive one morning with the report that Marsha's body had been found in her mom's freezer. Once the body was found, however, the investigation turned from what to who and necessarily shifted back to where it started. Ground Zero was 4,009 Copeland Drive, the Trimble home. The police thought that the perpetrator had to be a juvenile. To me, a rank amateur, uh, it didn't seem to me like a juvenile crime. But there was not much evidence to refute that conclusion. Uh, an FBI expert profiler who examined the de details of the crime, thought it was a juvenile crime. And maybe General Thurman will tell us what his experience has been with so-called expert profilers in the past. There were two mysteries. Um, one was a white 1950s model Chevy or Oldsmobile that appeared in the neighborhood at the relevant time driven by what witnesses said was a suspicious looking man with a large nose and bushy hair. The police did locate a person who fit the description, but he was eliminated as a suspect after intense questioning. The other mystery was what Ms. Maxwell saw, uh, as she described, looking through her hedge into the Howard's uh, driveway. She lived across the street from the Trembles and she was, as we've heard, the person who Marcia said she was going to see. She arrived home about 5.30 and began to unload groceries from her car. She looked through the hedge and saw Marcia at a neighbor's driveway talking with two other persons. One, she thought, was a neighbor boy, March Edgerton, who had been playing basketball with Marsha's brother. The other one, larger than Marsha, was wearing a long coat, and she thought it might have been a neighbor boy, Jeffrey Womack, who lived up the street at 4102 Copeland Drive. She was not sure, however, and the police never really identified those two individuals. Another factor that suggested that the killer was from the neighborhood was the location where the body was found. Uh, the garage was behind a house facing Estes Road, a short distance from the Trimble home. And logically, it seems that a killer, stranger, would not have known of this hiding place. 
Also, the location suggested that Marsha had been killed the night she disappeared while she was still in the neighborhood. It did, logically, again, it didn't seem that a stranger to the neighborhood would have taken her away and kept her for some time, killed her, and then returned her to the neighborhood, to the hiding place. So, all signs suggested that the killer was from the neighborhood. And the only people the police could positively identify were the neighbors and their children. The police on that Easter Sunday already had a prime suspect in Jeffrey Walmart. Jeffrey, a 15-year-old boy with, with life experiences unusual for other schoolboys his age, lived at 4102 Copeland Drive with his family. And you have seen on the map the uh, uh, relationship of the neighborhood, the relationship of his house, uh, the uh, uh, Trimble House, Ms. Maxwell, and the Thorpe Garage. Next door at 4100 Copeland, Peggy Morgan, 32-year-old divorcee, ran a child care business. Jeffrey worked for Ms. Morgan afternoons after he got home from school and at night. On the day of Marsha's disappearance, as we have heard, Marsha was looking for Jeffrey to come to her house to pay for some cookies. Ms. Morgan, the owner of the child care operation, and Amy Watson, uh, an adult with children of her own, uh, uh, worked at Ms. Morgan's house, and they were going to go bowling that night. Essentially, Ms. Watson and Ms. Morgan agree that Jeffrey left Ms. Morgan's house sometime in the 3 to 3.30 p.m. period after he had gotten home from school and returned about 5 p.m. Uh, he went with Ms. Watson about 5.30 to pick up some food for the children who were going to be in their care that night. They returned around 5.45, fed the children, and the two women left Jeffrey in charge when they went bowling around 6 o'clock. Uh, Ms. Morgan returned around 8.30, and the children said later that Jeffrey had not left while she was away. About 9.30 or 10, Jeffrey said he was going to help search for Marsha. Around 11 o'clock or so, Jeffrey went to the Trimble home because he heard that the police wanted to talk to him. As we have seen earlier in the day, Marsha had told her mother to watch for him. Around 11 or 11.30, Jeffrey's mother got word that the police had Jeffrey at the Trimble home and he was very upset. Ms. Wama called Ms. Morgan to go with her to get Jeffrey. The police had him in a back bedroom. He was stripped to the waist and had been searched. Allegedly, the search revealed a roll of pennies and a $5 bill in his pocket. Uh, Jeffrey denies that he had any money on him, and it was hard to corroborate what had been found, which might have been incriminating because the pennies and a $5 bill matched what Marcia had in her box as she was collecting. Uh, two officers who were there when they searched Jeffrey said they did not remember any money being found on his person. He did, however, have a condom in his back pocket. And he had written the gentlemanly advice to F you on one side of one shoe. So what more could the police ask for? <laughs> A sexually active teenager who lived in the neighborhood and was there around the relevant time was a perfect starting point for the investigation. Throw in the fact that the suspect had long hair and a rebellious personality 
and the case would nearly solve itself. The next day, however, Ms. Womack called Ms. Morgan again and said that the police wanted to take Jeffrey down to the police station to talk to him and give him a lie detector test. Ms. Morgan called her former lawyer, John Hollins, who agreed to help out. In addition to having a thriving civil practice, Mr. Hollins was a veteran criminal defense lawyer, a former prosecutor, tough, fearless style. He had represented Ms. Morgan previously, and she was concerned about what the investigation involving Jeffrey might reveal about her. There were a lot of rumors of teenagers in and out of her house, rumors of parties that involved adults and teenagers drinking, smoking grass, and Jeffrey, her next door neighbor, was one of her favorites. There were rumors about that also. He worked for her, and she had allegedly told the police the night of Marsha's disappearance that she was Jeffrey's alibi. And this is what Sherman Nickens said about that. When she said he's my alibi, she had been somewhere and bought some cookies or bought something, a takeout on a restaurant. I can't remember exactly what it was. Okay, what it was, it was something. And then we start looking into hers. Well, I come to find out, we came to find out, that she, supposedly, I didn't see her, supposed to have been having an affair with the 15 year old. That, and so she was giving him the alibi he wanted, needed. And, and he was a heck of a suspect right then to me. So if Jeffrey were to be charged and she became a witness for him, all the rumors about her and her lifestyle and what went on at her house would doubtlessly be explored. I don't know the truth about any of that, but a legit legitimate question could be asked, who was Mr. Hollins really representing? Was he representing Jeffrey Womack or both Mr. Womack and Ms. Morgan? And this is a situation that lawyers have to confront frequently. Clients that seemingly uh, have the same interests may, when the facts are developed, have, have adverse interests that present conflicts prohibited by the rules of professional conduct. I remember a case about 40 years ago that involved my friend Hewitt Tomlin, a fine lawyer from Jackson, later a colleague on the Court of Appeals. He had undertaken to represent the driver of an automobile, Patricia Woodruff, and a passenger, her little sister, Joan. They were in the same car. Uh, and so none of us thought there was any conflict. They had a, a case against the same defendants, a driver and the passenger in the car. But when the case went sour, Mr. Tomlin got sued for malpractice because he had a conflict of interest. Uh, uh, and the Sixth Circuit agreed. They said, simply enough, that in representing Patricia, it was Tomlin's duty to contend that Patricia was not negligent. In representing Joan, it was his duty to contend that Patricia was negligent in order to maintain a claim against her. The case is reported at Woodruff versus Tomlin, 593 F. Second, 33. Uh, and we all learned a big lesson from that. The ethical rules now explicitly provide that you can't uh, represent two clients who might have an adverse interest. But back to our case, I'm sure John Hollins figured all that out and doesn't appear that anyone ever raised the question. When he got involved, he took Jeffrey to an experienced polygraph operator to give him what we casually referred to as a lie detector test. The examination showed that Jeffrey was telling the truth. Hollins then called the prosecutors to suggest that they give Jeffrey another polygraph examination by their best operator. 
They did so. He passed again. And he was to undergo a total of five polygraph examinations. He didn't fail any of them. But the police were not satisfied. They continued to press for more answers from Jeffrey. They simply believed that they were on the brink of a big breakthrough that would seal his fate. Uh, so all of the investigation, and it was, there were a lot of other people that were investigated, that, but despite all the helter-skelter, days turned to weeks and weeks to months, and finally a year or more had passed, but they still had their eye on Jeffrey. Um, he had taken a job at the Jolly Ox, a one-time res uh, restaurant in Green Hills. The uh, police sent an undercover agent in there to take a job at the Ox. But he didn't learn very much except one night Jeffrey told him that the police were investigating him because of a murder of a little girl whose body had been found under a tarp. The tarp t turned out to be a key in the uh, undercover agent's mind, and the police thought that they had sealed their case. Uh, two days after the police arrested Jeffrey Womack, two detectives delivered a letter to John Edgerton, the father of a 10-year-old child who was playing basketball with Marsha's brother the afternoon she disappeared. The letter demanded that young Edgerton, now 14, submit to an interview by a psychiatrist, possibly, to be hypnotized to see if he had suppressed knowledge which would help in the police's case. He resisted that effort, and the, act, the uh, effort uh, came to naught. Uh, but the rest of the story is beyond the scope of this narrative. And so I commend to you Jeffrey Womack in jail on the charge of murder of Marsha Trimble.